Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to our um, seaweed um, talk today. This is um, this was an event that we were going to have in person at the Wildlife Trust, but sadly had to be cancelled because of the coronavirus um, situation. It's a great shame. Um, here at the Wildlife Trust, we're hoping to be able to continue to work with lots of our brilliant volunteers, and we would like we're going to be trying to do more of this sort of interactive. Um, sort of talks so that we can you know get some guys interested in both learning and um hopefully we're you know we'll all be really well prepared when we're allowed back out onto the shore so i'm just going to um, share my screen with you now and i'm going to start a little presentation which is uh which is the one that you would have seen at the event had it happened and i'm going to whiz through this presentation and just tell you uh tell you a lot of information as we go Probably best if, if the people listening in can just mute their microphones just so they don't have too much background noise. If you have any questions, wave and I'm, I'll hopefully stop you and answer, and uh, you can then unmute your microphone and ask the question. Okay. So anyway, here we go. So the the talk is um, seaweeds for rock haulers. So if I can get that to open, there we go. And uh, it's really an introduction. Now, I know in the audience we've got a whole range of different people, including some people who really are great at seaweed already, and perhaps some who, who this is new for. Um, so I'm going to try and, you know, I'm going to hopefully make it useful for both types of people. And um, really, though, this is an introductory level uh, talk. Uh, who knows, we might, we might uh, do a whole series of these and go into it in a bit more depth in the future. Anyway, as I said, my name is Matt um, from Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and this is seaweeds for rock pullers. So, first of all, on the subject of seaweeds, what's interesting about seaweeds? You might be asking. Well, we actually um, we actually have a huge diversity of seaweeds in the UK. When you go diving on a coral reef, you're amazed by the diversity of corals and, and other invertebrates. But when you go diving or rock pulling in the UK, I'm actually blown away by the amount of diversity of seaweeds. And we actually we have 640 species of seaweeds in the UK. This is taken from a, a lovely um, piece written by Stella Turk, one of the founders of the Wildlife Trust. Uh, 400 plus can be found in Cornish waters. And um, in one area, the Helford Estuary, which is um, our, where we have the original, the first voluntary marine conservation area in Cornwall set up back in the 1980s. And um, in that area alone, 300 species of seaweeds have been recorded. So they're, we're really lucky. We've got such diversity and they're fascinating. They're similar to plants, aren't they? But uh, a marine version, what they don't have is they don't have um, xylem and phloem like um, terrestrial plants. Instead, they absorb all the nutrients they need across the cell membranes on all parts of their sort of uh, their structure. So um, on, a, on this diagram, you can see, can you all see the picture? Not if you can see the, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. So we've, um, we, we call the um, the leaf of a seaweed, we call that a, a frond or a blade if it's a long, thin one. Um, we have a hole fast at the bottom of the seaweed that attaches it to the seabed. You often have a stem. Sometimes you get a midrib, which is like a thickening along the center, uh, center line of the frond. And we often have these uh, nematocysts or bladders, which, which allow seaweeds to float up towards the light to help them gain, uh, gain the, the light they need to grow. So that they focus synthesize um, and they need light. And what you find though is on the shore, as you guys are interested in rock pools and rock cooling, you'll find that you get a zonation of seaweeds. If you start at the top of the shore, you've got an area there that doesn't get much more than the occasional immersion or splashing, the splash zone. And you get certain species that love that habitat and don't live anywhere else. And then as you go down the shore, you find you get these bandings of different species of seaweed. Um, until we reach the very low shore on the big spring tides, we can get right into the kelp zone, which is where the largest uh, sort of brown seaweeds live. So we're going to start off, there's three main groups of seaweeds. Um, as you all know, they're the green seaweed, the green algae, the reds and the browns. So starting with the greens, we have um, 800 species approximately in the world and they have chlorophyll which is why they're green and um, yeah you find more of these in warmer warmer places apparently uh, and some people sort of theorize that these um, were the origin of our terrestrial um, plants so moving on we've got um, a very common one everyone know if you've seen this 
this is green, um, bright green sea lettuce. And you can, you can eat sea lettuce. In fact, you can eat nearly all seaweeds, but um, it's not a personal favorite of mine. I would, would urge a, a note of caution there, but if you're interested in experimenting with eating seaweeds, you have to make sure you wash them carefully, you have to be sensible. And there are guidelines on, by Natural England on how to do this sensibly. It's best not to pick seaweeds, better to collect ones that have natu naturally drifted up and landed on the beaches. But yes, do be careful. And I find if, if I munch on them, I, I do find sometimes give them a bit of a funny tummy, although I, you know, I do love the flavour. But anyway, go into that another time. So um, another uh, member of the same, this green sea lettuce is called Ulva lactica, and another species of Ulva forms little tubes. So unlike the flattened sea lettuce, these are little tubes, that's why it gets its name, gutweed. Uh, very common in areas of the shore where you've got some fresh water coming down, um, you know, often bringing nutrients. Now in the rock pools, we also find another species of green seaweed, and it's a lovely um, dark green and very fleshy feeling. Some of you may have seen this, not if you've seen this before. This is called Velvet Fingers, one of my personal favourites. So back in the day when I used to work in aquariums, um, I used to love this species because it's very, uh, most seaweeds will die if you put them in a fish tank, believe it or not, they're hard to keep alive, but Velvet Fingers will live for years and years. I don't think it grows very well in an aquarium, however, but it, um, it, it lasts and it's, um, there's several species, which is why it's, it's actually quite hard to identify them without a microscope. But keep a lookout for those in deep rock pools on the shore. When you look closely though at um, some velvet fingers, you may, once you get your eye in, start spotting these tiny little sea slugs. They're only a couple of millimetres long. And um, you know me, some of you, um, those of you who know me know that I like, I sometimes go off on tangents. Well, today I've got to try really hard not to go off on a tangent and start talking about sea slugs because I could be here for, for hours. And <laughs> so uh, anyway, but look out for that one, solar powered sea slug, fascinating little creature. Now the, uh, the next section, Know Your Kelps, was originally devised to really help our divers. So I've got a load of volunteer divers who will record the marine life they see, quite often they just write kelp. But actually there's only a few species, and this is quite a good one for, for divers and for rock pullers to get their head around because it, you know, you don't have to learn hundreds. So let's start with the most common species of kelp on the shore. This is all weed. It's a small species of kelp. You'll see it sometimes in rock pools or on the very low shore. And the way you can identify all weed, it looks just like all kelps really, same sort of colour, but it has a very flexible and um, finger-like style. It's kind of an oval shape, very uh, sort of flexible, never has anything growing on it. And it never grows particularly good, which is all laminaria digitata. Now, as you go further down the shore, you're going to find um, there's a nice little picture there, a nice clean site. As you go further down there, you'll find another species of uh, some more species of kelp. So this one here is is more common really on sort of sandy shores, I always find, or kind of more sheltered areas like estuaries. And this is a long, thin kelp called sea belt or sugar kelp, and it has this sort of crepe paper waxy sort of finish, very easily identified, quite a yellowish colour, and a long, um, a long frond can be over a metre long, quite, um, probably about six or eight inches wide, uh, quite a common species with a high sugar content. And this is the one that um, in, interestingly is being farmed um, on some of our mussel farms in Cornwall. Uh, the next one is a, a real beauty, the divers will know this well, it's quite rarely seen when you're rock pooling, except on the largest spring tides of the year. It's called the forest kelp. Now in this picture, you can see some of the stipes here that are completely covered in sea squirts. There's, you know, hydroids, there's even a little tiny um, cowry there. Um, but more commonly on the shore, you'll see them covered in red algae. And this is because the forest kelp has a really inflexible, long stipe. So it's got a rough um, texture and that allows plants and animals to settle and grow. So they get very shaggy, uh, often covered in red seaweed called duff. Here's a shot taken in Mount Bay last summer, some lovely forest kelp, absolutely beautiful seaweeds. There is a species though that's similar called the golden kelp, which is starting to become a lot more common. And you'll notice this washing up on our beaches a lot, particularly on the south coast. 
And this is a warm water species, not a non-native. It's actually an Atlantic species, but its range is moving, we think, perhaps due to climate change. We're certainly seeing a lot of it around the Falmouth area and Penzance as well. So if you find a large um, kelp that's washed up that has a smooth stipe that's um, got sort of more golden in colour, that will be uh, most likely to be the golden kelp laminaria area of the Uka. There's a nice photo underwater taken by Keith Hitchcock, really clearly showing you that, that um, stipe absolutely free of any, any sort of seaweed growth next door to a site that's all shaggy, which is the uh, forest kelp, so you can really see the difference. We're not sort of terrified that this species moving in will have a massive negative impact, although it, it, may, it may possibly reduce the diversity of, of other species of, of seaweed, perhaps, but only if, I suppose, if it became sort of a completely dominant, and at the moment it seems to be a bit patched and cheated. So the next kelp is called fur bellows. And some of you will, have, will, I'm sure you will have seen this in the rock pools. It has this amazing whole bust. So you can, this photo is a bit sort of unclear. If I click the next photo, you will notice it's got stipe. Stipe is flattened, very flattened. It's only about an inch wide. And um, they have a really, there's another photo of the stipe. But this is a, a really unique feature, this big warty sort of hold bust. It's hollow and it's made of, sort of the same material almost as the stipe, but um, covered in these little processes that on the underside start to grow out like fingers and that they'll be used to sort of hold on um, to the seabed. And when you find these washed up on the beaches, they do look quite sort of almost grotesque, don't they? And uh, that, but that is the, the fur bellows. And I, I wonder if that gave it its name or whether it was something to do with this sort of um, rough you get as well along the stipe. They, um, those are meant to be reproductive structures, little folds on the stipe itself. Yeah, a very easy one to identify. At the start of the growing season, sort of this time of year when you're diving, these, you find these huge sort of sheets, almost like toilet paper, um, on the, going along the seabed. These are fur bellows, um, fur bellows um, that are, are growing really fast this time of year. And the, the, um, the, the, the blade, quite often if it's a sheltered area, it doesn't split until later in the year, so it just looks like a massive, lump, uh, massive big, huge sort of kitchen roll. Amazing. Now the next two species, quite similar looking, um, one of them is a cold water species. This is a Lera. This is, this is only found in exposed locations, down on Penwith you find this, and uh, it's much more common further north. It's becoming quite rare actually, Dabalox or Alaria, about a metre long, with a, a, a distinctive midrib and a very uh, thin sort of membrane that sort of um, uh, plays through. But it could be confused with a non-native. So the next slide shows you wakame. This is um, the Japanese kelp. And it was actually introduced deliberately, we think, to uh, French waters for fish farming because it is eaten in, in, in um, very important as a food in Japan. Um, but it's starting now to turn up in, in, um, on the south coast of England, particularly in marinas. And this is a photo at Falmouth Marina. Up in um, Devon, they've had it for a lot longer. And um, we were out um, doing a shore search in Tor Bay, and we found a shore that was totally covered at low tide with, with wakame. So please, please keep a lookout. If you spot wakame, please report it to the Wildlife Trust or to the Marine Biology Association. We've got a project called the Wakame Watch. Um, because we are quite worried about this non-native species. So anyway, that was a quick whiz stop through the main species of kelp found in UK waters. We've got, um, we've got seven species and a little handout that I can email anybody um, for future reference. So hopefully when you're down on the shore, you're going to get, get um, used to identifying the kelps. So has anybody got any questions um, before we move on to the next? The next seaweeds. You've got, you've got any questions? I'm back on screen. Hopefully, can you all see me? Yeah. Excellent. So, um, yeah. So that was a, anyway. That was a quick whiz stop through some of the kelps. So um, now I'm going to quickly talk to you about another group of um, seaweeds. So, here we go. Let's show you the, the next. Oops. The next one after the kelps is. 
that on back up. So brown seaweeds. We've got a few smaller brown seaweeds that you might find on the shore. This one here is one of my personal favourites. A really delicate, thin species, branching dichotomously. That means with forks of um, two repeatedly. And this is Dictyota dichotoma, or brown fan seaweed. And uh, another one here, mermaid's tresses. This is, as a boy, we used to call this spaghetti. Feels quite slimy to the touch. Very common in more sheltered areas. And it, it has this kind of network of tiny hairs all over it that makes it feel slimy. And underwater, it looks really beautiful, as you can see. Each sort of prong almost glowing. One that's uh, always tickled me is this one, landlady's wig. So obviously whoever's, <laughs> someone's landlady obviously has some pretty untidy hair. So this is, uh, this is a brown seaweed, Desmorexia. Interestingly, the Desmorexias are the only uh, family of seaweeds that it's not advisable for people to eat. And some of you may know this story already, but the interesting thing about this species, this family, sorry, is they all produce sulfuric acid if you, um, if you try to, if you put them in a bucket with a load of other seaweeds to take home for pressing, for example, you've got to be careful because they start releasing sulfuric acid and it bleaches all the other seaweeds a different colour. And yeah, they're quite, um, I've never eaten um, this species as a result because I've been heard it's dangerous. However, I think you've probably got to eat an awful lot of it to really uh, get the full effects of the sulfuric acid. But um, this seaweed, Desmorexia aculeata, the landlady's wig, looks all fluffy like this in the summer months, but then by the autumn it looks quite different. The first time we came across it, it took me ages to work out what I was looking at. And here's a photo. Uh, it loses that fluffiness and you can just see the spines all over it. And uh, yeah, it almost looks like a completely different species. Now, some of you would have noticed these on the shore. There's lots of these around at the moment and these funny little mushrooms. And some of you probably know what these are, um, so forgive me if you know already, but um, the next slide will sort of give it away, I think. Yep, thongweed. So they start out with tiny little almost bubbles, brown bubbles on the shore, and as they grow they turn into sort of mushroom shapes, and what you'll notice is from the centre of the, each of these mushrooms there's a little dimple, a couple of dimples, and from that point a long like um, from you develop. Uh, another name for these is sea beans and at this time of year they're beautifully brand new fronds. Interestingly that's the reproductive part of the uh, seaweed. The, uh, the, the mushroom bit has the full set of um, DNA but these bits are reproductive so they only have half the, uh, the, the DNA, those are the gametophytes. Uh, so they're effect effectively for reproduction, although they're also a photosynthesizing amplifier energy as well. So they're doing a bit of both. And thongweed is really pretty. When you're snorkeling through it, you see, you know, it catches the light. It's lovely orangey sort of colours. Okay, another brown seaweed that you will need to look out for, wireweed. This is another non-native seaweed. Um, wireweed, sargassum meticum caused a lot of concern when it first showed up in, in the southwest in the 1980s but since then we've kind of grown to live with it. We've realised that actually although it appears to be smothering rock pools it there's very little evidence it actually is causing any harm and there's certainly lots of other species starting to grow on wireweed. Wireweed is quite easy to identify uh, but we're not advising people to, to rip it up and try and dispose of it even though it's a non-native because it is quite similar to a few other native species in appearance. This is snorkeling off the loo and you can see huge, uh, huge stands of wireweed. Okay, but a family of seaweeds that's quite similar are the, uh, the sister seras. And there's some sister seras that look very similar to wireweed and those are native species and they, they're arguably far more important to our local um, marine life because lots of other creatures and, um, and plants grow on them. My favourite of the sister seras is this one, the rainbow rack, also known as magic seaweed. And um, you can see this lovely iridescent blue colour. When you lift it out of the water, it goes a sort of a, a brownie colour. And then as soon as it's back in the water, the light shines off the tips of the seaweed. You can see why they call it rainbow rack. Absolutely gorgeous. Okay then, so moving on now, we're going to talk a bit about some of the red seaweeds. Now this is a big, big family. 
I haven't got time today to go into it in huge detail. Uh, I think, you know, in that earlier slide that said we've got 400, 300 species found in, um, in, in the helpers, the majority of them would be red algae. And some of them are very fine, very small, very delicate, beautiful things. But I'm going to tell you about a few of my favourites. And then obviously um, at the end of the talk, you can all ask questions or uh, I've got a few press CVs to show you as well. So as you can see in this slide, um, you might have read it already, it's very useful. Red seaweed is, is used um, the, um, in lots of different industries. Uh, in Ireland, they, they've been eating seaweeds for far longer than we have, and it's used. Um, Irish moss is, is something that's used as a thickening agent, and often turn, it turns up in toothpaste as milk products and labelled as carrageen. And we also use, um, we get agar jelly from red seaweeds. So anyway, so let's have a look at some of the family. One of my favourites is sea beach. You've got to be lucky to find it in a rock pool, but I did find some the other day down at Castle Beach before the COVID things locked us all down. But anyway, some of you who are lucky enough to live near the beach can still go out and do the rock pool and do exercise. You know, it is a good form of exercise. But, you know, make sure you're moving around a bit. You're not stuck in next to the same pool for the whole time, we might be in trouble. Um, but yes, yeah, sea beach is a lovely seaweed, lovely mid rib. It's got this sort of almost, it almost sort of looks feather like, doesn't it? Although there are, there are a frond, bright red. These fronds are sort of normally no bigger than your hand. And you see a lot of them when we're out diving. Okay, another species, a very common one I just mentioned, this is Irish moss, also known as carrageen. It's a small seaweed, dichotomously branching. Um, reddish, quite often quite brown, and what you often see are iridescent bluish tips, particularly when it's underwater. This is the one that the Irish would stick in, you know, they'd chuck it, uh, warm up some milk, put in some Irish moss, stir it around, boil it up a bit, and it would thicken the milk really beautifully, and then they'd add a bit of whiskey, in it, and that would cure anything. Maybe, maybe not coronavirus, but, but you know, it's a very uh, popular remedy back, uh, over in Ireland, and uh, yeah, there's another species that is very similar. It's called the false Irish moss. Oh, I've just had a little thing pop up saying that they've removed our 40 minute limit. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> I can bore you for a lot longer. <laughs> um, so anyway, the next one, false Irish moss. Uh, this, is a, this is very similar. In fact, it's, it's used by Irish as well. It has the same sort of properties of thickening, but it, it's quite different in appearance, much darker. It has this sort of folded frond. The frond, if you like, is slightly gutted. Um, you know, look at look at the cross section. It sort of curls at the edges, and it often has these little great pit-like extensions in the summer, which are reproductive bodies. That's the false Irish moss. Uh, right, another one that's very common all around the edges of our rock pools are these beautiful purple, purpley pinkish coral weeds. There's many species of coral weeds three common ones in Cornwall and they're all beautiful and when you look at them up very close with a hand lens you'll see these lovely little segments. Um, so coral weeds are one of the family of um, seaweeds that extracts calcium from the water and creates this calcium carbonate sort of um, reinforcement that makes it more unpalatable. So it's not one you can eat and it's not one that many species eat which is probably why it does so well. Very very pretty. It's always worth having a good look in amongst the coral weed if you find a little tiny starfish called Asterina bilactica, the uh, tiny um, cushion stars around the edges of our rock pools, there's all sorts of other exciting stuff. Right, this one's a good one, bright red, often found on the low shore, quite thick. This is red rags. It's quite rough to the touch. Hard one to miss, really. I'm sure most of you will have seen that. Really catches your eyes, being very, very bright. Another one that's quite similar, it's a flat red, but it has a tattily edge, is the beautiful eyelash weed. It's actually more commonly seen by divers, this one, but you might find it on shore. You might find it washed up after storms. It's close relative, Calibleferis jubata is called the false eyelash, and this has got much thinner crons. I've pressed some of these, they look absolutely beautiful, I'll show you in a minute. They're quite different, towards the end of the season, they get more shaggy, and this photo is taken in um, August down at Lee. I think, um, yeah, 
if you look at them now, at this time of year, they look quite different, quite sort of spiky. They don't have the, they're all bright red and they don't have the uh, sort of saggy bits, which I think are reproductive. Okay, so we're nearing the end of my presentation now, you'd be glad to know, but um, this one here is very tasty. It's one of the ones that I can't really resist when I'm out rock pooling. We'll always be munching on a little bit of dust. It has a really lovely flavour of the sea. As I said to you earlier though, I'd advise that you wash these carefully. You do ever eat seaweeds you find on the shore. And um, I wouldn't recommend eating too much. I think if you, if you, you get used to it, but I think it's got quite a sort of, uh, shall we say, sort of laxative effect. It can give you a bit of a funny stomach, so don't eat too much of it. And um, as I said earlier, you know, be, be very careful. If you are out picking seaweed, don't over harvest it. We've got some great guidelines that have been done by Natural England on the subject. You can find them on our website on the formal good seafood guide website. Anyway, dulse is very common attached to the rocks on the low shore and also attached to the kelps, as I said earlier, on the forest kelps, but it's got this flat sort of um, site, very uh, irregularly branched. See if there's another picture. There's a nice picture of it growing on the kelp. Okay, so um, next one, pink, fluffy, kind of a bit feathery looking. This is harpoon weed and it gets its name. Can you see in this picture it has these little tiny rhizomes which are root like structures that stick out which have got hairs all over them, spiny little hairs that act like velcro. So um, harpoons describes that quite well and this species is one that's being found in an increasing number of locations around the UK. We think it's getting spread very easily because it tangles up in fishing gear and in water sports equipment and gets inadvertently spread. I've not seen it on the north coast in any significant numbers, but I did find a piece of fistral once. But I suspect it was harpoon weed. Um, so who knows, it might end up taking over the north coast. It's already pretty much taken over the whole of the south coast. Are we worried about its impact on the whole environment? Well, fortunately, fortunately, no evidence, as far as I'm aware, that it's causing any negative impact because it sort of it grows in both clumps. Doesn't seem to sort of outcompete other species at the moment. But watch this space. There's a clump of it growing. It's actually quite pretty. You shouldn't say that. About, well, you know, about non-native species. We don't want any more non-native species. This one is quite pretty. Okay, now um. One of the, the groups of seaweeds that I'm particularly fond of is the beautiful red seaweeds called, family of seaweeds called coxcombs. And if you start collecting seaweeds, um, you know, to press, these are absolutely beautiful, especially if you magnify them and zoom in on them. So there's a, a photo of one in the wild. You can see each branch has lots of little branches with lots of tinier branches coming off that. And it's absolutely stunning. Several species. It's one that presses really nicely. And um, yeah, one of my favourites on Cocagium cartilaginum. Oh, I love showing off my scientific names. I apologise to you, Andy. Uh, <laughs> you've heard me going on about scientific names too much. I, just, I don't know why. If you're learning a new species, it's quite often easier to, if you're going to have to remember the common name, it's almost so, sometimes easier just to go and try and learn the scientific name because actually then you, you know because a lot of these common names have kind of been recently invented and some of them uh, you know as you know you go to different parts of the country there's different common names but the scientific names are always the same so it's quite good practice to try and learn them if you can if you're if you're a bit of a geek like me you can get carried away so watch out okay and then um another one it's quite a brownish color but it is actually a, a red seaweed this is a uh, pepper dulse. I have to double check that. I'm not sure if it definitely is a red seed, it might be a brown seed. But anyway, the funny thing about pepper dogs, it looks like love ferns. They're only about an inch or two long. When you bite into this seaweed, it is an instant taste shock. And some of you have been out rock ball and you will have tried it already. Not if you have. <laughs> it's, uh, it's maybe some people really dislike it, other people quite like it. I think it tastes a bit like um, garlic mushrooms. And uh, hence the name pepper dulse. It was used as a condiment, dried out and, and used, you know, for, for, for centuries. And starting to get a bit more, uh, a bit more appreciated nowadays. Again, do, don't over collect this one. Um, yeah, really intense, intensely um, scented seaweed. 
Okay, and then uh, the last picture, that's a terrible photo, apologise for that, but often in, in our rock pools you find encrusting pink algae. If you're out doing a shore search survey, it's, there's no point really trying to identify these. There are several species, but we, they are really hard to identify without genetics or samples. So we just write EPA, encrusting pink algae. One family of encrusting pink algae is very important, as you know, to our ecology in the southwest. We've got several areas like the Ballastry, where you find big banks made up of merle, which is an encrusting pink algae, which grows in a sort of nodular structure, a bit like twiglets. And they form this incredible bed, rich in um, wildlife, lots of new species, and uh, very fragile habitat that's very rare in the UK. In fact, the, uh, the mill beds in the Fowl are probably the best example of mainland England. The only other um, areas where there are mill beds that are as good are probably in Brittany and uh, Scotland and Upham and some parts of Ireland. And there's a close up there of some mill found on the shore, and we sometimes find it washed up. That was down at Castle Beach, washed up after a storm. So there you go, that's the end of my presentation. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'm going to uh, show you some of my press seaweeds now, and also I'd like to take a few questions as well. So I'm just going to close this down a minute. Um, what, one thing that I uh, didn't say at the beginning was if any of you are interested in learning your seaweeds, can you all see this? Can you see me now? In order to can see me? Can everyone see me okay? Yeah? No. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, um, if you would like a book on seaweeds, I'd recommend this one. This is Seaweeds of Britain and Ireland. So before this book came along, seaweeds to me were a real mystery, but this is uh, produced by the Sea Search Project um, of um, Marine Conservation Society. It's a great little book. It's £19.50. Matt, can you people can see the whole book. Brilliant. About head height, Matt. That, that is a, a fantastic book. We, I've, I've got a big stock of these at the Wildlife Trust. I would have tried to sell you at the event, but, um, you know, I'm sure we can organise something. Um, I'm sure we can buy the mail order from the Marine Conservation Society still. Another great book, and still my Bible, is the Collins Guide to the Seashore. The section in here on seaweed, though, isn't brilliant. I actually think the section, um, you know, this book's far better for seaweeds, but this is great because it's got a little bit of everything and it's still my getting to be rock pooling book. So, yeah, so um, just as I was mentioning, a few pressed seaweeds. This, um, this is a few that I collected the other day down at Castle Beach that we pressed at the seaweeds for divers thing. Uh, Mark will remember these. We've got some Calabrephorus ciliata, that's the false eyelash, some harpoon weed, uh, some Osmundia, this is Pepperdolls. And this one I haven't identified yet, but collecting seaweeds and drying them and pressing them like that is a great, uh, great way. It's, it's quite satisfying. It's a great way of keeping a record of what you store, and um, they are they can then be posted off to experts or even just photographed. And um, there's some great references of pressed seaweeds at the Natural History Museum and in other places around the country that will help us sort of piece together what these are. They're probably far easier to identify from a pressed specimen. So there you go. Um, thanks for that. I hope you could all hear me and uh, see the images okay. Um, so um, I can't unfortunately see everybody's face on my screen. Um, I'm going to try now. No, try. I don't uh, manage participants. Don't I? Right. I can see. I can see a lot of um, people here. So um, has anyone got a burning question they'd like to ask before? We'll move on. Anyone got, anyone got any questions? So if you do have a question, just unmute your microphone and um, ask. I've got one. Hello. Hi, Liz. Hi there. Um, I always um, struggle to um, remember the difference between Laminaria digitata and Ocraluca. Um, yeah. Is it really obvious by the colour? Because I'm not even sure I've seen Ocraluca. Is yeah. it really obvious gold colour? Yeah, I would say the, the main difference is that Laminaria digitata always has quite a short stipe and it's very flexible. If you were to come across a piece of golden kelp, um, you know, the stipe is much stiffer. 
It's, and it's okay. about the same size and thickness as the stipe of a forest kelp. Okay. So it is strikingly different. And I think on the shore, it is very rare to see Laminaria opera luca. You have to go a bit deeper. Okay. So what you're mainly seeing is going to be digitata. But yeah. the colour is not what you should go by. It's those okay, no, like, no. The colour <laughs> quite often kelps can be golden, can't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean Where's they're the golden kelps. Where's a good place to see it then? Where's a, where's a good place to go to try and see it? Well, snorkelling off um, Castle Beach, there's loads of it. Um, and on the Roseland as well. So around um, Lighthouse Beach, if you know that one on the Roseland, lots of golden kelp down there. I'm not okay. sure about your neck of the woods though. No. Because <laughs> no, I haven't maybe. been snorkelling up, up in East Cornwall for a while. Though, so. um, but I'm sure you'll find it one day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, anyone else got any questions? Cool. So, um, would you be interested in a uh, another video like this on um, how to press seaweeds? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be interested. Yeah, yeah that'd yeah. be cool. Yeah. yeah, I have to admit, I'm starting to get quite hooked on it, and you don't need specialist equipment, which is great. Um, and I'm starting to get quite a nice little, nice little collection. Here's another one. There's some spotted scarf beads and they're, they're quite decorative as well you can put them in a little frame and give them away to your family for Christmas presents they're gonna love that aren't they <laughs> <laughs> maybe not all of them but <laughs> no, they're yeah. they stick them in a little box behind me can I just ask a general question about the growing cycle of seaweeds I, I yes. assume we're about to see an explosion of growth and and how fast do they grow yes that's a great question they're growing very quickly at this time of year and they start you go through all these sort of stages and in fact our, um, we had a, a seaweed social for the divers a few weeks ago and one of the people who, who attended was called mickey and um, he runs a blog called Anne Bolognessor, which is cornish for seaweed uh, for rock pool hunter and what he did is he went to castle beach and photographed seaweeds every month and put them onto his blog so i can send you the link david it just shows you this okay, interesting you. sort of phases that what you get fresh growth of certain species and then they start to die and, and whilst that's happening new species are coming through so yeah it is quite fascinating the pattern that he witnessed um on the shore i mean in, in general i think yeah now's a very very productive phase and now is when they look the most beautiful um, but quite soon they, you, they'll start to look a bit more shaggy and a bit more damaged. And as soon as we get any big storms, obviously it sort of rips them up and, uh, and shuffles them up again. But yeah, um, a, a lot of seaweeds will are annual, so they'll grow really rapidly and then by the end of the year they'll almost completely die. Many of them will leave the hold fast and regenerate from that. And I remember some studies being done on the Isle of Man by an old lecturer of mine, he's retired now, but he, he actually did a load of studies on Ascophyllum, the egg rack. It wasn't in my presentation, but anyway, couldn't include everything. And he reckoned that egg rack um, hold fast could be decades, if not hundreds of years old, but just every year they regrow, which is quite quite interesting. Yeah, and then and there's other species like um, rainbow rack, which dies back, and but um, it obviously lives for a long time because you've got colonies of um, all kinds of different invertebrates, sea squirts, and so on. Yeah, hope that's answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thanks very much. <laughs> so it's a great shame that we've had to cancel our um, shore search events. Um, we were due to be coming to you, David, to Mounts Bay to go to Stackhouse Cove, weren't we, in April? But um, the advice of our um, management team at the Wildlife Trust is to, to cancel all, um, all of our events until definitely the end of April and possibly further, depending on the situation. So it's a great shame. But we will, like I say, we will be trying to do what we can. So please get in touch if you've got subjects you would like to learn more about. I've got loads of these little presentations. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm happy to, to do more of these if people want them. And um, yeah, keep on uh, keep on learning about your marine life, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank right. you. I'm, I'm going to stop, stop the recording in a minute, but yeah. Thank you.
All right. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Give thanks, thanks, Matt. Give me a shout. Um, fire an email if you've got any more questions. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Cheers. Bye. 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 Cheerio, Matt.